Well, I think it's the top of the hour, so we should get started. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today because we're going to be talking about a fantastic topic with a great pair of guests. I'm Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm its host, its curator, its chief cat herder, and I'm going to be your guide to the next hour of conversation about where higher education is headed. Now I'd like to welcome this week's guests. These are the authors of a new book on a subject that we've been exploring. It's what I'm very passionate about, and it's one that I think many of you are interested in. It has to do with the emergence of new science about how humans actually learn, the ability to look at brains, to look at nervous systems, and to look at our entire biological setup to figure out how we actually learn and how we do it well. We've had a couple of guests in the past who have helped us explore this, and I'm really, really excited to welcome two more. They're the authors of a new book called GRASP, uh, The Science Transforming How We Learn, which I recommend. And let me just bring them up one at a time. To begin with, uh, I'd like to uh, spotlight Vice President Sanjay Sarma. Now, if I'm going to be talking about Sanjay, uh, the number of titles he has is going to get really, really daunting. Uh, an endowed professor, the author of hundreds of articles, member of a ridiculous amount of boards, starter of companies, vice president of MIT. The question I want to put to you, uh, Vice President Sarma, is first of all, what are you going to be working on for the rest of 2021? Um, great to see you, Brian. And I have lots of things I want to do. Um, I have uh, research in virtual reality, augmented reality, uh -huh. working on new massive open online courses. Uh -huh. uh, I'm trying to get... Uh, um, some work done in um, artificial intelligence, in learning. There's just so much happening. You know, learning, you know, I like to say that the 21st century begins in 2021. It didn't begin in 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Google and Amazon and all these companies were already there in, when we came down, when, when the, cent the century officially turned. Mm -hmm. But we have just been through a one year of human digital transformation. My parents in India can give me Zoom tips now, you know, and, um, you know, we're all sort of surviving on various um, online technologies, etc. So I am excited for all the opportunities for this new century. Oh, fantastic. Well, welcome. I'm absolutely delighted to see you. And just quickly, where are you today with that great bookshelf? Are you in Cambridge? Or? Uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in my house uh, in, uh, yeah, in, in, in Boston. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Hold on one second. I need to introduce your uh, colleague, co-author, and co-conspirator, Luke Yuquinto. Uh, and Luke is a science writer um, who has worked for, among others, at Smithsonian.com and a few others. And he's your co-author. Luke, hello. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much uh, for having us. It's, it's such a delight to wander into this uh, tightly knit group as, I, as I'm learning, as you know everyone everyone by name. It's, it's really fantastic. Well, it's my pleasure, it, even though you have committed the terrible crime of shaving your beard off this morning. I did it, yeah. But Luke, I, I, I'm, I'm curious. Let me put the same question to you as I just put to uh, Sanjay. What are you going to be working on for the next year? What are you going to be writing on and, uh, and thinking about? Sure. So I, I wear a couple hats, and uh, I'm involved with the MIT Age Lab, which studies uh, the future of old age. And um, we have this really cool um, series running with the Boston Globe where we're talking about turning Boston into an innovation hub for um, for longevity. Mm. And so that's that's a monthly series that's going to come out in the globe um, this whole year. So I'm really excited about that one. Oh, fantastic! Well, that's great news. Um, that's uh, there was some interesting work being being done in uh, Toronto about uh, uh, trying to repurpose Toronto as their population gets older and older. Um, happening and happening everywhere. Not to not to sidetrack it, but. I, the idea is, can we do this in Boston? Sure, but it's also to to spark uh, kind of an upwelling of innovation around around aging. Great, I'm glad to hear you're working on. It. Even though you look like you're about 11, um, I think uh, you, you'll you'll be well positioned for that. Really shaved. That's terrible. It's terrible. Uh, friends, at this point, I just want to ask a couple of quick questions uh, of our authors. But the key purpose here, the future trends forum, is for you to ask your questions and to ask the authors because you have their attention for the next 55 minutes and we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, one question I wanted to ask both of you to, just to get the ball rolling is, you know, when we think about higher education and trying to transform it, trying to improve how we teach and how our students learn and how all of us learn, what, what are the major lessons that we can take away from GRASP, 
in the science of learning? What are the most actionable steps that we can really apply now? Let me take a quick stab and um, and um, maybe Luke, you, you should fill in all the things I'll leave out. But I'd say two quick things. The first is if we we have a little bit lost the pl- you know there's a there are two extremes in learning. What, you know every professor one thing we want to do is transform the individual, but the other thing we do, which is a little bit of a conflict of interest, is grade the individual and figure out how good they are. And there's a conflict, right? If a student doesn't learn very well, is it my fault or is it the student's fault? And so that's a conflict. And I fear that our education system, the pendulum has swung too far to the grading uh, or the winnowing aspect. Mm-hmm. And that's what we write about. And we need to really focus on the first part, which is transforming the individual. So that's sort of one thing, right? Mm-hmm. The second uh, thing is the science of learning. I expected it when I started this journey seven or eight years ago to be clinical and cold and, you know, sort of, mm-hmm. you know, just me- mechanistic. You know, you must eat, you know, 30, 13 grams of protein and exercise for 17 minutes before you study, you know. But actually, the science of learning is, when you look at the neuroscience, is surprisingly human and warm. Mm-hmm. And what it reminds us is that we, uh, as human beings, I mean, assuming most of the audience is human as well. We are, that was a joke, sorry. Uh, we are um, actually uh, evolved to learn, and our learning instincts are those of children, even when we're adults. Mm. And our teaching instincts are those of parents, even when we are, you know, teaching adults. So it's a sort of a human thing, you know? Yeah. And no parent sets out to teach saying, I'm going to give you a grade and see if I can fail you for this year. Yeah. Every parent goes in with a contract that I'm going to transform you. And the science of learning, uh, a lot of the things that come out of it are instinctive and unfortunately foreign to what we have in our many education institutions. So those are my two big comments. Luke, what did I miss? There's probably about 10 things. Uh, well, I guess I, I would say we don't, we don't know what you missed, and, and that's, that's part, of, part of the whole issue. So in, in kind of our journey of describing the, uh, how learning works in the, in the brain, we've we describe the sort of multi-tiered structure of how things work at the neur- neuron level and in the brain systems level and the whole brain level, the cognitive psychology level, educational psychology level, social psychology level, way up here. And the number of things that has to go right for learning to happen well, let alone optimally, is, is a, a, based on just what we know, is a remarkable number of things that have to go right. B, there are certainly things in that stack that are happening that we don't know about yet. Mm. And mm. so what, so an, an analogy is, is sort of like for, for this book, I had the, the pleasure of sitting in on this renowned MIT engineering course, course 2007, mm-hmm. which is sort of the gave, gave birth to first robotics and, and all this kind of uh, ro- robotic competition uh, education. And the professor uh, was talking about, engineering uh, the Saturn V rocket back in the 1960s. And, and he was saying, you know, there are so many things that go into this that have, every single one of them has to work perfectly or this thing's gonna blow up. And not only that, it's so complicated that you have to divide it up among people because no one person can hold it all in their brain all at once. And that's more and more, A, that's how I've been thinking about learning is all these things have to, have to happen at the same time at all these different levels of organization. B, in the week leading up to sitting in on that course for the first day, I had the worst educational nightmares of my life. Oh, I just, I don't know if I was waking up in a cold sweat or what, but, it, but I was just like, dreaming about failing classes, dreaming about not having my assignments together, dreaming again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once I got there, it was a really wonderful time. And I met a lot of great students and professors. Yeah. It was really stressful. And it occurred to me, there's nothing in my past that I have so many nightmares about compared to education. Mm. And that's bad. Yeah. That is bad. And granted, I've let, I've, I've stipulated, I've led a charmed life, but that tells you something about, about what we expect learning to do and, and what we internalize about, about learning, I think. And so, I mean, mm. that's a, that's a place to start, I guess. 
So between the two of you, you seem to share the same thought that our current education system is beautifully built for something that isn't learning. Um, uh, yeah. You have this, early on in the book, you have these, these passages and you keep coming back to this theme of winnowing, where that seems to be more and more the, the point rather than learning. But let me, let, me, let me get back, let me get out of the way for a second because we have a whole raft of questions I wanna make sure people get to, to, get, to uh, get to ask them. Uh, we have one from Kiel Dumsch, uh, who is a longtime participant, who asks, what are the author's views on letter grades, age segregated grades, and the degree system? All flawed ideas put into place more than a century ago. Well, you know, I mean, I think that, um, first of all, uh, in making change, uh, people have tried in the past to start from scratch, and it's very hard to make progress. So um, do I like letter grades? Um, I'm not a big fan of Churchill, but he had that quote, right, that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, democracy isn't a great system, but I can't think of anything better. Uh, I think that we do, in the end, need to give uh, some sort of, you know, uh, certification that someone's learned. Is it letter grades? Is it a percentage? I grew up in a system with percentages. Mm -hmm. I thought it was horrible. We would fight for the last, you know, one, you know, 97 versus 97.2. That would determine your fate, actually, because 10 people got into college. And if you got 97, the other person got 97.2, yeah. you know. So I uh, degrees, I think degrees are too monolithic. And also there's a sort of a social contract there that I don't particularly agree with. The social con Just imagine if I told you, go to the gym for the first four years of your life and you're going to be fit for the rest of your life. Wow. So the degree, you do a four-year degree and you're expected to be ready for life, right? Mm. Actually, I think the future is a much more granular form of education where you're sort of accumulating credentials as you go, right? So, I mean, I, I have mixed feelings about it all. I would just say that um, we're better off starting. The America system is pretty good. It's not great, but it's actually much better than what the rest of the world has because trust me, I'm from there, right? And I think we have to improve it, but I think it's hard to start from scratch. So... I hear that. I hear that. Um, uh, Keel, thank you for the question. I'm sorry, Luke. Did you want to jump in on that as well? I guess I, I would just add. You know, to Sanjay's point about about scraping for that point point one of a percent. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me of of a marathon where they have those new Nike flyweight shoes, and it gives you a fraction of a percent advantage. And so now everyone has to wear those shoes, and you're and you end up striving for that little tiny advantage. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I just like to take a step back and say, why why are we in a situation? where every advantage matters. Why, why do we put students in a situation where every single little thing is, is, so, is such a fate determiner? And, uh, and could, is the humane thing to do to be, to, to say, you know, instead of changing the nature of the race, maybe we just find ways to make the winner circle seem a little bigger. Mm, it's the opposite of, uh, of winnowing. Um, yeah. Well, I think we may have a, a, a response for you from a uh, member of the uh, participant group. Uh, this is uh, Peter Wallace from UW Continuum College, where he's the Director of Learning Systems and Assessment. Hello, Peter. Uh, your, your audio is off. I can't hear you. It's okay. Take a second. Everyone goes through this. Now your video is off as well. Now you're back. How about now? Perfect. Hello. Okay, good. I had to switch the microphone. Thank you. Uh, and thank you both uh, for speaking so directly to the issues that you've both seen in education. Um, there are ones I've seen as well. And I, and I have talked to friends of mine about, you know, their educational experiences and almost all of them relate nightmares, right? All of, <laughs> almost all of them have that same story of my dad, who's, you know, multiple graduate degrees still has nightmares of um, being in high school in his pajamas and having to go back to high school because they, he missed one class. So it's a very common theme. One thing that I have noticed particularly right now is teachers passing along stress because those teachers are stressed. And it, a lot of it, from what I've seen, has to do with those teachers trying to do too much, being asked to do too much. They have to know Zoom or shindig or whatever technology, they have to know grading, they have to know how to give feedback, they have to know how to give a lecture, they have to blah, 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 blah. And I often kind of say that I feel like education is one of the last, um, one of the last, uh, the phrase is actually disappearing on me now, but 
one of the last cottage industries mm. where someone's given a, a theoretically raw product and asked to turn it into something else from end to end. Mm. And I'm wondering what, from both of your perspective, is the role, is the better role of um, specialization, right? Do you have, how do we create, should we create an educational system where there's a truly a specialist in assessment? truly a specialist in lecture, truly a specialist. And we're not asking teachers to be specialists in the whole gamut. Thank you again. Oh, thank you. Great question. Well, um, as a professor I, and as a vice president for open learning, I'm a little bit biased, but I think that having every professor go through this cottage industry of taking, as you said, the raw and baking a new dish of varying quality and uh, serving it up to students, I think is uh, very flawed. I am a big believer in online asynchronous video education. Uh, what I mean by that is Khan Academy, you know, he's an MIT alum, by the way, several degrees from MIT. Mm -hmm. He's a fantastic lecturer. Mm -hmm. Honestly, the and I'm a good lecturer. He does better lectures on the topics he gives lectures in than probably I could, all right? Why should I not, in under those circumstances, become a coach? Because that is a high bar, actually. Being a coach, we somehow think it's less, but actually it's more, right? Now, I, the, so that's a flipped classroom. And then if you take um, software uh, platforms like edX, what we do is we put the assessment that can be done on edX on, in the software. And then we can play all the cognitive psychology tricks that, the mind, that, are, mind, that are human friendly and makes it much more fun. And then the professor, or the coach, becomes, the, that's the flipped classroom, right? It gives curiosity, you know, gives guidance, uh, context, uh, maybe does some counseling sometimes, you know, you're struggling with something, okay. that's the future. What are we doing right now? It's, it's, I think it's really bad what we're doing to our students. I'm sure Luke will disagree with me <laughs> vehemently on this. No, uh, you know, it, it's funny. Uh, I mean, you can, this is kind of where my, where my worlds meet a little bit. Th there are other, until recently, cottage industries like that. So I, you know, I think about um, a travel agency which people thought were, was going to disappear in the, in the last 20 years and it, with the rise of kayak and places where you can book your flights online and stuff like that. And it's like, no, it hasn't disappeared. It, the travel agency has become very focused in on things that only humans can do. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you see that, you see that in like in financial advisors, that's like another example. Um, so it's like, it, you do see the sort of cottage industries becoming less of a cottage um, for sure. Thank you. I'm just, I continue to be interested in how we do that in education. Um, and I know that's a long road. I look forward to reading the book. I haven't gotten to it yet. Thanks. Well, thank you, Peter. If you, read, if you buy only three books this year, buy just, just buy our book three times. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's one way of doing it. Um, uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, that's how video questions can work. Uh, we, we, we beam you up. It's it's that easy. And uh, it, it looks like Sanjay and Luke are, are pretty uh, gentle with you. Um, uh, it, it's a bit entrepreneurial. So um, we're glad to uh, we're glad to hear you as well as to see you. Just uh, be gentle need... with us. <laughs> well, so far we're being, I think, pretty good. Uh, we have another question that's come up from uh, our long-term friend, Tom Hames. Is how do we get more marginal students to care about their education and to get away from transactional thinking? Look, let me, if, can I go, let me take a stab at this as well. So there is a whole field of research called uh, situated cognition. And there's actually a lot of research on this. So let me just give you an analogy. So let's say that you have two children or two young people. One is the, ch one has a cobbler as a parent and the other has an accountant as a parent. And they're both studying, both the uh, kids are studying math, right? Now, the math teacher is saying to the students, listen, learn the math. Trust me, it's going to be useful for you at some point in life. Trust me. The child of the cobbler is going to go back and watch, you know, dad cobble away, I guess, right? And the, the child of the accountant is going to go home and see mom working uh, with a calculator and doing math. So the, 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 the latter child has received instant uh, reinforcement of the value of something. So one of the challenges with the folks who come from different circumstances is context and relevance and reinforcement thereof. So education that provides context, part and parcel of the education itself, reduces marginalization. And this is uh, some great work that came out of, uh, actually, there's a lot of work on this, Jean Lave, uh, Jean Lave, et cetera. Um, and uh, so, for example, if you teach math to a fruit seller, you want to put the problem in the form of, you know, 
uh, you know, if you sell three bananas and two, right. you know, one goes right. out. So there's a lot of work on it. And it all comes down to just making our pedagogy better. It's good. It's good anyway, but it actually helps a little, quite a bit with uh, with folks who are come from diverse backgrounds. Yeah. And I mean, just, just to add, you know, this, this goes back to Dewey, where I, he, would, he would say, you don't want to be studying for your, for the benefit of your future self, which I think would be the transactional ex example. You want to be studying because you're curious about it in the present, or you have some use for this knowledge in, in the present. So he would set, set up these sort of microcosmic society where the students would, would have use for their, for the, their new knowledge. And of course, you know, in some, in some famous and highly reputable uh, programs, there are chances for students to put knowledge to work, whether you're building a robot or building something else, um, you know, building, building a five page essay, I think is still a beautiful thing to build, frankly. Um, so, uh, you. you know, I hate to say the answer is just like pro projects that kids care about, or students care about, but. So those are two very, two very different answers, although they complement each other. Um, the idea of situated cognition, uh, which I just tweeted out about and, uh, and Luke's idea, of course, of having relevant germane uh, to experience. We have a couple of more questions that follow up along these lines, and I want to just make sure that we can uh, put them together. Uh, Bart Trudeau asks that uh, in-person interaction has a positive impact on diversity, equity, um, and considerations. Should colleges, to, should colleges encourage students to choose on-campus learning whenever that is possible? Oh, 100%. I mean, just for the record, I'm not in favor of doing things remotely. I'm in favor of doing the things that we should be doing in person and doing the things we could do remotely, remotely so that you can actually increase the time spent doing the things we better do better in person, like coaching, right? Professor, in fact, I argue that when a professor stands on a stage, you have 100 people in the classroom, you're doing socially distant learning to begin with. Mm -hmm. All the room did was expose that, yes. right? So yes. when we go back to the classroom, if we go back to the same old Zoom windows, except we're in the same room, what a tragedy. What we should focus on when we go back is for the in-person to really be in-person, right? We've got to make the in-person count. It doesn't. We took it for granted until nature confiscated this privilege, you know? That's a great answer. And, uh, and you mentioned this in the book several times. Um, let, let's, let's hang on to that thought for a second because we, we had another question which follows uh, along those lines. Uh, and this is from... Uh, uh, Rachel Niemer, who went to my alma mater, the University of Michigan, uh, and she asked us, how might your work in GRASP help inform how we created differentiated experiences so that students who come into college less prepared leave as educated as the privileged? Do you want to go that, uh, Luke? Sure. Um, we'll keep that up on the screen. That's a good question. Yeah. You know, I, my, my big takeaway, especially for equity, is, is that we don't, think enough about how demanding we are of, of students in some ways. And so if you, if you have a, a whole slew of students who are just kind of at their wits end, trying to, trying to figure something out and, and perform uh, really uh, and compete against one another, um, you can imagine that those students who have come with a, a disadvantage of, of some kind would be just at the margins harmed. Um, it's, it's sort of like if you have a bunch of flowers in uh, sh growing and some are in the shade and some are not in the shade, it's just it's just at the margin, the, the ones that are not in the shade are just going to have that much of an easier time growing and they'll, and they'll get picked and so on. And so when I think about these um, things, especially from neuroscience, we're talking about um, uh, working memory and so on. I, I say my, my takeaway is just to, to take a step back and say, how are we imposing restrictions on learning in terms of, in terms of kind of the nuts and bolts of how it actually works that's going to disproportionately harm someone who's, who's coming with some kind of a disadvantage? Yeah, I mean, the other thing I'll say is, in fact, MIT just had a task force look at, you know, how we should rethink our learning post-COVID. And one of the things that came out was the hidden curriculum. So what that means is that... Uh, you're releasing um, these amazing students into, you know, what, what we think of uh, as something like a garden, which is MIT. But some know all the by the byways and which store tells sells, you know, good, you know, hot cross buns and you know which ones don't. And a lot of the students who come from different circumstances don't have that hidden curriculum. 
And there's also a matter of self-advocacy. There's some, there's frankly a little bit of, uh, you know, I'll use the word, you know, there's a hegemonistic sort of thing where you feel like you don't deserve it. There's an imposter syndrome. Okay. And these are the things we need to actively combat. Otherwise you end up, regardless of what you, what your intentions are with disparate uh, outcomes. And that takes a, you know, that takes a bite out of cognition too. It, like, yeah. that, that affects your performance on the day in the classroom. It takes a bite, a bite out of working memory. It's, it's really harmful. I mean, we, we see that in the research around stereotype threat on test day, but it's also just in class. It's also when you're studying. It's, yeah. Yeah, and the cognitive load of uh, being yeah. stressed about feeling whether you deserve to be there, exactly what, uh, what uh, Luke talked about, the working memory, uh, all that stuff is depleted because you're spending, you're wasting cycles on things that someone from a more um, privileged background doesn't uh, bother with. So having a structuring a campus to be more egalitarian is not just just and fair, but it is also much better for learning. Yeah, I mean, so for example, if someone doesn't reach out for an internship, it's one thing to say, well, they didn't reach out. But it's another thing to say, what? Okay, can, can I help you with this? You didn't reach out. You know, you might want to really consider this and just bridging that gap because that gap is where the, the uh, imposter syndrome just displayed itself. We had a, a, a kind of comment on this uh, from uh, the splendid uh, Kelvin Bentley, who's been a guest in the program before. Um, and uh, he argues that uh, adult students will not always be able to do things on site. We need to find ways to continue to enrich online learning environments so they're not just basic Zoom sessions. And Kelvin, if you don't mind me building on that just a, just a little bit, if I understand where you're going, what have you two found uh, in terms of the science of learning that really applies to online learning? I mean, what, are, what are some of the cognitive approaches that we should be using to structure how we do synchronous and asynchronous teaching? So let me just frame it, but uh, I'd like Luke to talk about it. But um, Zoom is not online learning done right. Zoom is jury rigged uh, in person learning, you know, where we just sort of phoned it in literally, right? And the teachers are heroes. I mean, the people like to throw the teachers under the bus, but they've been amazing, right? It's just the system. And as I said, our lectures were socially distanced to begin with. All that happened with Zoom is they became more obvious, right? Now, asynchronous online education, think of edX, think of Khan Academy, that's a whole other shebang, right? And then synchronous can be used differently. And maybe, Luke, why don't you talk about it? Because they just wrote about it. Yeah, sure. I'm. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, especially when we're talking about lifelong education and adult education, I think we're, we're often also talking about just being respectful of people's time and, and, and delivering things as, as, frankly, efficiently as, as we can so that, you know, people have to go put food on the table and set the table and put their kids to bed and, and so on. And, um, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a way to do that uh, asynchronously. That's, that's a big help. Also, I would say, you know, it's funny. We, we get into, in pretty, in pretty deep depth, kind of two different ways of thinking about the optimal journey for the human brain from, from a state of ignorance to, to knowledge or not having skills cool. to having skills. And we devote five chapters to that or so four or five chapters to that. Mm -hmm. Then we have to take a step back and say, you know what, though? There is no one brain. There's no the human brain. Everybody has a different brain. Everyone's mm -hmm. going to, to a certain extent, be able to going to want to move at a different speed through different through maybe a different pathway to follow their own path at their own speed uh, to what they want to know. And so one thing that some of these different online uh, ecosystems that Sanjay has mentioned offer is just uh, an individualized um, pace and path. And that becomes especially important when you just don't have much time to devote to, to learning on a, on a given day. So back to asynchronous and uh, kind of personalized self-driven learning. Uh, th this is great. Uh, friends, we have more questions coming in. Um, so don't be shy. And again, please click the raised hand button if you want to uh, uh, join us up here. Let's throw page. one thing in here, Brian. Please. Except, uh, you know, it's a glass half empty. If you have no water, any water in a glass is water, right? So if you don't have access to all to in person, good online is fantastic. But if you ha can have access to in person, absolutely get it. Right, that's the way to think about it. But good online can make a huge difference to both. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, depending on where we start. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions have circled back to uh, some of the comments you all made before about uh, 
and the mental state and structure of learning. Uh, Catherine Velberg asks about the role of failure in learning. Uh, we tend to do anything that might result in failing, and yet we only really learn when we fail so that we try again. Well, this is something I've uh, had to deal with a lot, uh, both as a professor, as an entrepreneur, as a student. And um, I think we have created a, 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 such a revulsion to failure. We've erected such tight guardrails on the straight and narrow path. I worry that uh, we, we, re, we sort of train out of our students the gumption and the courage. They do it anyway, thank heavens, to you know, wander off the beaten track. And, um, you know, I mean, for example, school grades, you got to get, if you want to get an A+, plus, you got to get every homework just right and just, you know, you can't mess it up. And if you want to take that kiteboarding vacation, forget it, right? But maybe the kiteboarding vacation is actually going to teach you more about physics that you've learned because it gives you some sense of it. So it's this very strange thing that we've created, very tight electrified guardrails. And I worry greatly about this. And by the way, for all my problems with the SATs and the GREs, you take them away and you leave it to the school grade. You, the school grade is based on how straight and narrow you were to some extent, right? As opposed to sort of goofing around and nailing the SAT. So, so I have mixed feelings about this current uh, trend. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I would say in, adi in addition to that, that um, you know, we're talking about fu futurism for, for a little bit because this, this is, I know this is a futurist place. Um, you know, our, our current our current way of doing things is, in, in many respects, ed tech. It's it's applied science, and only the sciences from the 1920s, right? Like I think someone brought that up in a, in a in a comment. And there's already not too many places for failure. We have to build that in. Um, so this robotics competition, for instance, how you actually do in the competition doesn't have a direct bearing on your grade in the, in that class that that I that I discussed. You know, when we when we talk about the future, if you talk about um, a more artificial intelligence guided pathway through something, for instance, and suddenly instead of having high stakes exams, you have every single little thing you do become a point of assessment. Like, where does the failure happen? Where, where are you going to have a sandbox where you can experiment and, and fail? Or, or are people going to think that through? Or are they going to always be assessing you? Um, so yeah, it is, it is a worry now. It could be a worry in the future. It's a really good question. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, th the next question ties into this, I think, pretty nicely. And this is from uh, the awesome Roxanne Riskin that I mentioned before. Uh, she said that learning is social and emotional. Is this aspect addressed adequately in higher ed? And can you also talk about debunking learning styles? Because so many uh, educators and learning designers hold on to this concept. So two different questions. So why don't you start, Luke, and let's re-debunk learning styles. <laughs> sure. Um, so, so learning styles predates um, the, the work of Howard Gardner, but it kind of kind of hits the ride on on the wagon of, of multiple intelligences, which is which is you know really a really interesting and, and frankly well supported idea about about how intelligence works and how you can have this type of intelligence and that type of intelligence, and it's not all reflected in the more traditional broad based uh, intelligence uh, things, but. That was never meant to sort of, imp and Gardner has written about this. That was never supposed to sort of, it was never supposed to imply the existence of learning styles where you can only teach a certain student one way or another. Right. But but people with the best of intentions kind of hitched a ride onto onto that wagon. And I mean, it's really interesting stuff about you could have a stroke and have a lesion in one part of your brain, and suddenly you have trouble with math or something, and you never did before. But it's it's just there, there's a lot of you know, more holistic top-down research into whether these methods actually make a difference in, in terms of uh, how students do. And, and there's a whole body of research that says it, that it doesn't really help. Yeah. It's, hard to, it's hard to prove the negative, but it doesn't seem to help. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think that in terms of social and emotional, yeah, learning is social and emotional, especially amongst young people, but also amongst uh, uh, older people. Um, and... Uh, that's why, and, and if we did it right, the classroom would be, uh, you know, a lot more teamwork, a lot more coaching, a lot more sort of counseling, all of the above. That's, you know, the Montessori system uses peers. And there was an earlier question about uh, uh, segregating by ages. And the thing the Montessori system does is it permits the ages to interact. Mm -hmm. And so net-net, uh, 
I think that we can create much more uh, sort of uh, uh, socially and emotionally uh, warm and um, nurturing environments. But sitting in, a, in the black of a classroom, you know, just flipping your pen and, you know, looking at uh, Instagram images while the professor drones on isn't social, it isn't emotional, uh, and it isn't uh, valuable. One, one th I mean, one thing we, we explore is uh, do you sort of, it, it, you do put a premium on, on these social emotional connections and you know, do you burn it all down and start over with a, with a Montessori higher, higher ed or do you kind of shoehorn some emotional space into the existing framework that you already have? And, you know, we've seen some real success with that where we talk about um, the, the Teal classroom at MIT, which is a very um, peer to peer uh, education oriented setup for physics instruction. Um, but there, there, there are ways to, I, I think of it almost as like in the 70s when Monty Python would appear on the BBC. You'd have like a news program, then you'd have Wild and Crazy Monty Python, then you'd have another news program, right? And so you can shoehorn, mm -hmm. you can shoehorn the humanistic stuff into a, into a framework. By the way, I will say medical residencies have an element of Montessori with an element of some of distressing overwork thrown in. And uh, wow. grad school has an element of that as well, grad school in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, it can, although with its own enormous guardrails for failure. Um, yep. uh, just, I just wanted to come back to something you, um, uh, you, you said earlier when we began all of this, uh, um, Sanjay, that, uh, again, this is still what you're describing as a way for, for people to learn without being cut out of the system, uh, without being tracked down or being winnowed out. Um, we we have more questions coming in. I want to make sure that uh, everyone gets a gets a crack at them. We have two that are actually very specific about um, uh, about your your work together. One is about MOOCs. Uh, Paul Walsh asks about uh, where is the data on how to use engagement to move the dial on progression, since we have millions of learners having signed up for MOOCs. Uh, yeah, I mean, so the uh, as it turns out. Um, the data from the MOOCs is actually not as easy as we expected to use truthfully. I could I could give you, uh, I could be glib about it, but the fact of the matter is that um, we have to be very thoughtful in using the data. In fact, it, there are two types of data: data that you get incidentally when you run the MOOC, and I'm telling you that's somewhat valuable. You can see, you know, from the commentary, this part of the video was difficult, and I sort of tuned out there and things like that. But it's very hard to figure out where how engaged students were, etc. And so from, from incidental data, you can also do, on the other hand, intentional experiments based on cognitive science, where you can you know, have some material and see how well people responded to that as opposed to something else. And not much of that has been done. So engagement, in my view, is an open question. Games, simulations, virtual reality, augmented reality, things like that will kick in. There's also a slightly more intrusive approach of using cameras to see people's emotions um, uh -huh. and the questions around that. Uh, and then the one thing I do not recommend doing, although some people have tried it, is putting uh, EEGs on students' uh, heads to see if they're paying attention. And please, let's not go there. That's one of the uh, interesting debate areas that's come out of uh, 2020. Uh, as you said before, uh, Sanjay, the beginning of the 21st century was just how much monitoring we can do of students. Um, uh, thank you for the for the really good question, and and thank you both for the for the for the solid answers. Um, more have come in, and uh, there was actually one very specific question about uh, the hidden curriculum. Uh, this is uh, comes from Kate Sierra at Texas Wesleyan, and she asked if you consider using tilt techniques created by Marianne Winkleness. I, uh, I have read about Tilt. Uh, I have not used it. I haven't actually thought about it as much as I ought to, so thank you for that. Let me go think about it. Uh, I did read it in, you know, in I forgot even where, and I was intrigued, uh, but I haven't gotten around to it, so. Okay. I'll just, uh, in fact, let me just uh, put that link out for everyone to see. Let me test a, there you go. Testing new features on Shindig every week, I do that, so you can all see Tilt Higher Ed. Uh, that come. Um, and then we had one more from uh, Charles Finley, um, not too far from you all at Northeastern. Um, and uh, Charles asks, I like the idea of doing learning as efficiently as possible. 
So how do we change the system to overcome ideas such as the Carnegie unit of time per credit? Uh, what do you think, uh, Luke? Do you want to answer that one? Uh, I mean, that's like <clears throat> that is a really good question and, and something we 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 go back and look at the history of, of things like the Carnegie unit and the and the, and the push towards standardization. Um, uh, how do we get away from it? I, prag, prag, I don't know, Sandra, do you have any pragmatic yeah. ideas? Yeah, I, yeah, I threw you under the bus there while I thought about it. So, I can <laughs> um, it's an old uh, interview technique when you have a, a, a friend and a colleague in take a job. Um, so, so the uh, look, uh, philosophically, the last century, uh, or the last 150 years have all been about interchangeable parts and interchangeable people. Mm -hmm. First, you know, we talk about interchangeable parts, but it was actually about interchangeable people, if you think about it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And to make people interchangeable, you needed to give them, you know, um, like, you know, this NPT thread, you know, sort of spec, you know, so you could specify the, you know, like a, like on a, on a pipe thread, right? You have specifications mm -hmm. on them. So you got to really sort of standardize them. Mm -hmm. For that, the Carnegie unit is very, very uh, a good measure because you can see how many hours, uh, you know, their their butt was in a seat in a classroom, and then you can sort of say, well, that's you know, that's their metric, and also it helped with interchangeability of credits across institutions. The problem is that uh, we are now beyond um, interchangeable people. We are now entering a world when the things that pe interchangeable people can do could do automation can do by definition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So in fact, we are now looking for people who are by definition human and different and brilliant and do the things that machines can't do and therefore are not interchangeable. And so I think net net, absolutely, we have to get beyond uh, Carnegie units. Having said that, oh my God, the inertia and the system and all the, the entire network effect built around it it's going to take some major uprooting and it's not going to happen instantaneously. I think it'll start with adult learning. That's where we can start. Do you think competency-based education can play a main role in this? Yeah. Yeah, I think that Southern New Hampshire has done great work on that. Luke, you were going to say something along those lines, I think. Yeah. I, was just going, I was just going to say, just, just going back to the, to the sort of the spaceship model of, of the brain where, where everything has to be working in perfect concert. When I think about stuff like the like the Carnegie unit and other elements of standardization that were introduced in the nineteen ten you know nineteen hundreds teens twenties, um, a lot of that represents an early effort to reverse engineer all that all that stuff in that stack of of neural necessities that we that we talk about in the book, and I think what kind of drives me nuts about the Car Carnegie unit is it's it's just this this nineteen twenties era scientific idea that is just frozen in place and as Sanjay says uh, it's the inertia is, is something else right so yeah and just as an aside when I said NPT I was referring to the national pipe thread tapered standard by the American National Standards Taper Pipe Threads Association you know what I mean I mean that's that's what we did to people I, right? I assumed everybody knew what that stood for <laughs> um, but the uh, uh, we have a Thank you. Um, uh, th I love where this conversation is going. And uh, I want to bring in a, a colleague of mine at uh, Georgetown University, um, uh, Ryan Downey. Uh, and he has, uh, he, among other things, he does anatomy and physiology and does a lot of work in neuroscience. So let's bring up Ryan. Hello. Hello, Brian. And it's always a pleasure to uh, be able to join you up here on the stage. One of the things that I've noticed uh, running through this entire conversation is that we keep coming back to emotional aspects and affective aspects of learning. We spend so much time thinking about the effective elements of going into the classroom and teaching, but the affective qualities of what we do really make the difference between someone having a traumatic experience or having a really positive experience. And so my question here, what tips, what strategies, what things do we need to change about the educational system right now would encourage those positive affective elements that would facilitate learning? Mm. Well, go ahead. It was just the funniest thing. I I just started watching Ted Lasso. You guys watch that show? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not over there. So he's he's a co he's an American football coach brought 
brought into the UK to, to coach a, a soccer team, a football team in the UK, and he has no idea how to do it. But he has the affect aspect of coaching down pat. He's an amazing affective, you know, his, his EQ is off the charts. And he had, actually has an assistant coach who figured out all, all the soccer stuff for him. And, but he, he manages his players. And it's, and it's kind of a wonderful show to watch, to watch him do it. And I almost feel like that's, if we talk about the content of learning and we talk about maybe the possibility of you would have an online lecture that you might, that a, that a teacher acting as a coach might, del, might deliver, you, then, then what is that, what is that coach teacher doing? That affect aspect of it is, is essential. It's a, it's a very human to human. It's the kind of thing that, that a computer cannot do. So it, it becomes almost central. It should already be central to the job, but it becomes extremely central to the job. Hmm. Yeah, and I just add that, um, you know, the uh, the speaker and journalist Paul Tuff has written about it, mm -hmm. a number of books about it, and I recommend, uh, um, I've read only a few, but I recommend them. For example, he talks about, um, you know, how children succeed and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, grit, well, and the imposter syndrome, and it's all sort of an affective thing, right? So, Well, he'll be uh, on this program later this year. Um, very, very good writer. Yeah, no, I really appreciate those insights because we spend so much time talking about nuts and bolts that that human to human contact often is a topic we don't spend enough time on it. So I uh, re really do appreciate that. Well, Brian, you. if I've got time, one uh, last question uh, that's related to one of the early topics is hi. Uh, how, how do we transition from the current model of uh, four years, you're in, you're done, you're out. Uh, that, that's going to keep you fit uh, after a couple of sessions in the gym for the rest of your life. How do we transition uh, into more of a lifelong learning model, May, maybe going into those uh, recurring uh, learning loops that, that we've seen in uh, the Stanford uh, model of uh, next generation yeah. education? Yeah, so I think it'll go. It'll it won't it won't start undergrad out. It'll go uh, work backwards. So and so, so what's happening with high school is um, in Europe, for example, um, in Switzerland, for example, vocational techno votech schools or vocational education is very important in high school, and you can almost get a community college like degree uh, half while you're still in high school. Mm -hmm. and I think where we'll end up with is college won't change, but folks who are working will get into continuous education. High school students will get more and more into skills that can get them a job right away. Mm -hmm. And it, the pressures from both sides will cause college to rethink its uh, structure into not a monolithic four-year sprint, but into stacked micro-credentials. We actually call it agile continuous education. We didn't write about it in the book, mm -hmm. but I think this is the future. Uh, we had a quick response to that from an uh, uh, earlier questioner, Kiel Dumsch, who asks, uh, if employers keep demanding attainment of the degree, though, then people will keep getting them along with the debt. Yeah, the problem is the employ the employers are the graduates of college and the mm -hmm. students who look like them. So to prime the pump will take some time. But I think they, uh, you know, 10 million people uh, and many uh, who are not even, who've even given up on the labor market out there today in America, I think we're gonna see a lot of changes in the way employment works and the proxy of the degree will, will will be less important than your success in the last gig. And so continuous education is going to become a bigger deal uh, in the near future. Okay. Well, good answers. And uh, Ryan, thank you. Thank you for the good oh. questions. Th thank you. Really appreciate every week that we get to spend time together. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, we're almost out of time, friends. And uh, I wanted to uh, uh, give you a chance to answer one more question from a questioner and then one from me. This is... Uh, uh, from uh, uh, Kenan uh, Salinero, who asks uh, two whole system approaches that could be well suited for understanding learning process. These would be Sadi Lalu's installation theory and Arawana Hayashi's SPT. Are you familiar? No, I'm not. And uh, I made a note. Uh, and I'm going to actually, I did not make a note. And I'd love to see that uh, chat transcript at some point. So I'm going to put that in the chat right now. And uh, I'm going to flash that. Uh, uh, on the screen for everyone uh, to be able to see if you just want to uh, jot down these uh, these terms. And uh, I'll also add them on uh, on Twitter as well. Uh, Maybe say one thing, which is I am an engineer. Um, I'm not an educator. Well, I, I'm an educator, 
but I'm not an education theorist. I've read up the cognitive science and education theory. Uh, I am a big believer in when I see something new, I want to see uh, randomized control trials to see if they work. Uh, but I did look up installation theory, and it has uh, something called embodied cognitive uh, competencies, which generally appeals to me. But I would have to do my research before I comment. I appreciate the, uh, the honesty of that. And then a, a, a question for me is, is uh, a, a little a little more basic, but a little more future looking. Um, if, if we can take grasp and we can assign this to the brain of every college and university leader in the United States, and we, we let them follow grasp's uh, advice and thinking, what does higher education look like after say five or 10 years? What would be some of the differences that would really leap out at us? I'll request Luke to answer this because I'm too close to it. Yeah, sure. Um, well, so you, there, there, there's one sort of um, heartwarming story uh, in the middle of the book about a, a law school, actually, that um, they start teaching um, study, study techniques and, and they start requiring it of, of their sort of their lowest quintile of performers, I think. And then, but basically all the students start taking this additional course on how to study for law school at, at law school. Uh -huh. And the law school's ranking... And it's a it's a school in Florida. It was like always kind of in the middle. It's been the top school ever since. It's just a meteoric rise since they started teaching these study techniques. Hmm. And and not, not only that, these are these are first generation students. A lot of them like from mm -hmm. you know really really heartwarming stories. And and they're succeeding. And their bar passage techniques are through the roof. Their bar exam passage technique or are, 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 statistics rather are through the roof. And so it's a heart, heartwarming story. <coughs> the, the flip side of it is. Every school that's not doing it, you have these same first generation students who are failing the bar exam and not getting to become lawyers, some of them. And so there's a dark, there's a dark side to it too, which is that if we're not doing it, there's a huge amount of attrition that's happening. Hmm. And so one thing we could say is one way a school could could adapt some of the stuff we talk talk about in the book is just is by shoehorning it into their existing structure and say, you know, in addition to everything we're gonna do we're doing here, we're gonna teach you how to study to better perform within our school. Now, the other thing you could do is say, take a step back and say, what are the things we do here that are hamstringing how we learn and how can we remove these impediments? How, are we introducing hurdles to the cognitive science of learning for students that we could actually remove? And so like sort of the, sort of the, the, Florida, State, the Florida International University answer is to say, you know, we're gonna teach students to, to hop the hurdles. And we're going to keep the hurdles there, basically, but the students will learn to hop the hurdles. The other possibility is to get rid of the hurdles. And so, yeah. you know, maybe even you could do both. So, that's hmm. If we paid as much attention to student success, I mean, like true success, as we do to the success of sports people, you know, NFL team, <laughs> we do really well. Well, that's a fantastic moment to end on because we've actually just shot through our hour and... Uh, with incredible velocity and an awful lot of great ideas. Um, not just pipe fitting and how to unpipe fit people, but, but thinking about a real 21st century way of learning. Um, thank you both so much for all these great, great responses and, and thoughts. But let me ask, how can people keep up with the two of you when they want to get uh, a bit more Sanjay and a bit more Luke? What's the best way? Luke has a Twitter handle. Sure. Uh, my Twitter handle is just my name, Luke Quinto, with the, the little at symbol in front of it. Sanjay is, is wiser than me. He's off Twitter. But so feel free to tweet at me. Well, very good. So we'll, uh, you, you'll be the intermediary. Um, well, again, uh, thank you both. I, I recommend Grasp for everybody. And uh, I thank everybody for your questions and comments. But don't go away yet. I have to mention where we're headed for the next time. So we have a whole series of uh, of uh, of. Uh, Topics coming up over the next few weeks. Uh, we've got uh, a really great session on supporting equity, another one on reinventing a university, sessions on analytics and leadership and how to close campuses. If you want to talk about this, I mean, the questions of what does assessment mean? How do we you know, try to get away from failure? How do we teach teachers how to teach better in terms of, of, of everything from asynchronous learning to uh, social and uh, emotional literacy? We can keep talking about this. We have all kinds of channels for that. Now, if you'd like to go back into the past and take a look at some of our previous sessions, uh, we have nearly 250 recordings at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, including several on this topic of science of learning. 
thank you all again for wrestling with the ideas uh, together. This is vital stuff as we progress through 2021, which may be, as Sanjay said, the first year of the actual 21st century. Thank you all for thinking with us. Please take care and above all, stay safe. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.